Hello, welcome to Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror. The Halloween season is upon us, and here we are again in the Basement of Horror. Thanks for joining me. Let's get right to the topic. It's nice seeing you again. Hope you enjoyed your summer. All right. Here's what we're going to talk about today. Look at that. 45 minutes of this. Can you believe it? But if you think that's something, I've got even more splendor for you. Oh, look at the chips falling off of this one. Oh my gosh. Look at that. Yes, sir. I, I hope you're glad you tuned in. Oh my goodness, this thing's falling apart. This is what we're going to be talking about today. If these things will survive long enough to do a show about them. What are these relics? They're, they're literally crumbling in my hands. These are Bayshore rubber masks. Looks kind of like a top stone, but it's a Bayshore. And it's hard as a rock, as you might imagine, from the looks of it. A lot of Bayshore masks look like that, unfortunately. But we're going to see a few that look better. Hopefully, I, I think so. Let's uh, bring in. Let's bring in this. Here's a few more that are in similarly poor condition. Now this, as you can see from the edges there, that is extra crispy. That's a base shore. It's barely there, barely surviving. No matter, no matter how I do it, it's going to fall apart. Here is another Bay Shore. It's a shame that this one is in such bad shape because he's kind of cool. But he is also falling apart, turning hard, cracking all over. That's a Bay Shore, a Bay Shore mask. And here's another one, also in terrible condition. So these are relics. These are just barely existing. And that's a shame. I, I wish I could save these masks, but look how shallow they are. It's very difficult to foam something like that. And they're in such bad shape anyway. I mean, how Here's this lady. How do you foam that? I guess you could. I mean, that one's deep enough, but it's difficult. But look how bad it is. It's, it's not really even worth trying. It's a kind of a futile thing. So these poor masks are just dying. They're in this little graveyard here, waiting to die. Poor things. But not all base shores look like that. However, that does illustrate one of the problems with trying to collect base shore masks. They're in such horrible condition, many of them, and they, they rot so easily. It's really difficult to, 
to collect them in the way you might collect top stone, which is also prone to rotting, or Don Post, which tends to hold up pretty good. Don Post masks are high quality, and if they've made it this long, they're probably going to survive, survive a lot longer. They might get hard, but they don't they don't lose their shape. They tend to stay in a good shape. They don't crumble into, you know, potato chips. So, let's see here. What should I show you next? Okay, here we go. Here's a, a Bayshore mask that's a little bit better. He's holding up much better. He's turning hard on the top, but other than that, he's still pretty soft. He's called the Continental. That's the name of this mask. He's the Continental. Kind of like the Saturday Night Live character, the Continental. You can see he's got a lot of personality. That's a very vivid mask, very vivid expression. A lot of character in that mask. And very shallow. Not a lot there. It's a half head mask, meaning it covers the front half of the head. It doesn't go over the head and have a top. And it isn't full head. It doesn't cover the back of the head. It's just a half head. It only covers the face like a Ben Cooper plastic mask. And that's part of the problem with these is that, like a Ben Cooper plastic mask, they have little staples, little metal staples, and rubber bands attached. So when they're new, when they were new, they had little rubber bands. And that little metal staple reacts very poorly with the rubber. And that's why these, these edges, this is where the hardening and the rotting starts. It's around here and it spreads up. And this one has already got a little crispiness right there. Because rubber doesn't like metal. And the fact that they all have these little metal staples, I think that's part of the problem. I think there's a chain reaction that starts there and spreads. So that gives you a little hint of what we're going to look at. Uh, Bayshore masks are kind of a forgotten Halloween, iconic Halloween mask company. Bayshore is known for blow molds. Uh, all of these, except this little one, all of these are Bayshore. I don't know about the little one. He might be Bayshore too, I'm not sure. But I know the big ones are. They're all Bayshore. That is a Bayshore blow mold lantern. And I say a lantern because a light bulb goes in there and it lights up. So see our episode on Halloween lanterns. He's in there and many of his friends are in there. I did an episode about blow molded Halloween lanterns. And we talked a little bit about Bayshore in that episode. Just mentioned it really. But Bayshore made this and uh, made a whole lot of other blow molds. They're known for their Halloween blow molds. They're also known for plastic masks. Some of them were made in France for Bayshore. They're known for toys and novelties, joke items, joke store novelties. And they're known for their rubber masks. But you don't see a lot of big Bayshore mask collections because, first of all, how do you display them? You'll see some in a, in a, in a few minutes. They're so shallow and thin, you can't put them on a mask stand, you can't put them on a mask form, you can't put them on a styrofoam head or a glass head. It's very difficult to display them unless you clip them onto something, and then you've got that problem with the rubber and the metal, and it'll just rot. And they're so old now, most of them. They're all rotting. And they seem to be a little more prone to rotting than top stone masks. At least my experience is pretty much every Bayshore mask I've ever owned has 
rotted. Some some rotted completely away, and I just had to throw them out. Uh, there, there's two kinds of Bayshore masks, the ones that have rotted, the ones that are going to rot. That makes it hard to collect. It's hard to collect rotting things. And because of that, I think they've really missed out on their place as uh, icons of Halloween. I think, well, obviously, Don Post, and Distortions, Be Something Studios, all those companies, Ben Cooper, Collegeville, Halco, Imagineering, Fun World, they've all, they all have a seat at the table. And I think people who are interested in Halloween and nostalgic Halloween, I think they know what those companies are. They've heard of those companies. Top Stone. Uh, thanks in, in part to a collector that I know. I think Top Stone has, uh, risen in in prominence over the last 15 years for some reason i don't know why uh and people today are more familiar with top stone than than they might have been 20 years ago 25 years ago but the company that really hasn't had its day is bayshore that's still an unknown there's other companies that are unknown but that one in particular is still very much unknown, unsung. People don't talk about it. No one really cares about Bayshore. And not many people collect Bayshore. So let's talk about Bayshore and see if we can shed a little, a little light on this unsung Halloween company. Hey, it's my notes. My, my notebook is back. First of all, I want to thank my colleague, Derek Grant. Derek Grant for digging up some information on Bayshore and in particularly this one article here's a picture that's we're going to talk about that in a moment that's an important person in, in Bayshore history so Derek found that article that article and some other sources went into these notes that I've compiled so thank you Derek okay so Bayshore Industries uh, it was founded in 1946 by Alvin L. Gersha and Eugene Salinger. Alvin Gersha and Eugene Salinger of Pittsburgh. They were looking for a location to build a balloon factory. They wanted to make latex rubber balloons. This was right after the war, World, World War II, and all latex rubber was allocated towards military purposes. There was a balloon shortage. You couldn't go to the store and buy balloons for parties or whatever. All the rubber was being used by the military. And a lot of products were like that during, during World War II. There were shortages of a, num a number of products because those industries were uh, turned to align toward military use to support the war effort. Then after World War II, it started to open up. So there was this balloon shortage, and they thought they could get in on that and make some money and start a balloon factory. So they scouted around, and they chose the town of Elkton, Maryland. Elkton, Maryland. And the reason they chose that town was because it was near the Chesapeake Bay. I don't know why they thought it was important to be near the bay, but they did. They thought being near Chesapeake Bay was so important that that's why they based their factory in Elkton, because it was near Chesapeake Bay. So they called the new company Bayshore Industries, founded in 1946. And they started making their balloons, but then they found that the balloon market wasn't all that they expected, and they couldn't keep their staff employed year-round. They had to diversify, and they thought about making toys, getting into the toy business. And that's when they found Rudolf Mofko. He was a professional sculptor, painter, and toy designer. He had worked in the industry designing toys. They hired him to design some toys for them, and then made him vice president of Bayshore Industries. This picture that I showed you earlier is a photo of Rudolph. 
That's Mr. Mofko right there designing some masks for Bayshore. And you see some of his designs on the wall behind him and some of the toys that he designed on the desk in front of him. Mr. Mofko started off by designing a basic set of iconic Halloween characters like a devil, a pirate, a princess, etc. And then he let his imagination go wild and he came up with this bizarre rogues gallery of all these weird, surreal characters, creatures, monsters, some really strange designs. These took off. The masks were very successful. And part of the reason was the price. Before Bayshore, most rubber masks were four or five dollars. Bayshore introduced a much lower price point, 29 cents to 98 cents. So anyone could afford one of these cheap little rubber masks. And there was a mask fad going on, and Bayshore fed into that. And that's one of the reasons for its success, along with Top Stone, which is a story for another day. Uh, Bayshore was one of the companies that popularized rubber masks in the late 40s. By 1953, Bayshore had sold 6 million masks and they employed 1,000 people. I sourced that from two newspaper articles, and that's hard to believe, but 1,000 people? Wow. In 1961, Amsterdam, New York, recruited Bayshore. So they didn't just move there. Amsterdam campaigned for them to come over and relocate there. Bayshore moved its operation to Amsterdam, and apparently there was a lot of fanfare, a lot of press. They made a big deal about this. But no sooner do they move to Amsterdam than a company called Minor Industries buys Bayshore. There is a merger, and Bayshore becomes part of Minor. And I couldn't find information on that either. Uh, I didn't spend days and weeks looking for it, but it wasn't anything readily available as I, I was looking for information on this the history of this company. The front end of the company with Mofko and uh, Gersha and Sollinger and Elkton, there's some good documentation on that. But once you get to this move to Amsterdam, then it gets murky. There's not a lot of information about what happened after that. Uh, but interestingly, by 1978, Topstone owns Bayshore, or at least the, the IPs related to it, and apparently a lot of their leftover stock as well. In 1979, Topstone is selling novelties under the Bayshore brand name. It's one of the lines that Topstone offers uh, to its retailers. So Bayshore becomes part of Topstone. And at that point, Bayshore is pretty much a non-entity. Then it's a it's a brand owned by another company. How it got from these two guys making balloons, hiring this artist who was the visionary who made all these masks, to the buyouts and, and the company just kind of disappearing finally, I don't know the second half of that story. It sounds interesting. It, it's going to require some more uh, research to dig up all that. Maybe someone out there knows. I'm sure there are some Bayshore experts who could just tell you all about and everything that happened. But let's just let's take a minute to appreciate Rudolf Mofko. A lot of people know Keith Ward. Again, thanks to some collector out there, I think, who's been pumping it up the last 15, 20 years. But a lot of people know who Keith Ward is in, in relation to Topstone. He was the genius who designed all these masks uh, and sculpted them and started the, well he didn't start the company but he came in very soon afterward and, and he created the company as we know it. He didn't found the company but he, he joined very soon after, just like Mofko. Mofko didn't found Bayshore but he came on very soon afterward and transformed the company. So without Mofko we probably wouldn't be talking about Bayshore. Without Keith Ward we wouldn't be talking about Topstone. But there's information out there about Keith Ward. Um, and there's probably information about Mofko, but it's not known. We don't really know who he is as, as collectors. We don't talk about him. 
But this is the guy who designed the iconic zombie mask. You might not know any other Bayshore mask, but you, if you're a monster collector, you've probably heard of the zombie. It was their biggest selling mask, according to what I've read. The zombie mask was their top seller. And it was introduced very early on in the company's history. It's known to monster kids because it was used in an, an advertisement. There's a magazine ad where you can order the zombie mask, just like, you know, there were Top Stone ads in Famous Monsters where you could order those masks. And that's a big part of the mystique of Top Stone. And it's also a big part of the mystique of this zombie mask that you could order it from a magazine ad. And people know it from that ad. It seems just from looking at catalogs, like they keep reusing those same mask designs decade after decade beginning in the 40s through the 50s, into the 60s, and even into the 70s. Of all those masks, only the zombie has really become iconic. The zombie is really like the shock monster of Bayshore. But if you see some of these other designs, you'll probably recognize a few. You'll, you'll say, oh yeah, I saw that. I, I've seen that mask before. So let's look at some other masks. Uh, let's see here. There's our friend, the Continental. Come over there. Some people like the crinkly plastic on this show, so I try to crinkle some plastic for you. Okay, here we go. Now here's a lot of Bayshore masks look like this. This tiny little mask, now this, this is rotting, and I'm going to try to save this one. He's really crispy there, see? I'm going to try to save this little guy, because I like him. But look, imagine trying to display that little thing. There's someone on eBay trying to get close to $200 for this. I think that's nuts. Because I, when I discovered it was rotting, I said, well, maybe I'll just buy a replacement. I went on eBay, uh, maybe not. Maybe I better try to fix this one. I don't know the name of this, this guy. We'll set him right there. I feel like he's just going to fall apart right in front of me. Here's another one that splitting this little guy and you see there I, I had to patch him up with this tape just to keep him in one piece and I did that just yesterday preparing for the show because otherwise he would just fall apart and he feels like the kind of rubber they used to make uh, like, like those chunky school erasers you know those big those kind of gray chunky heavy erasers like, I don't know, do they call them gum rubber erasers? He feels like he's made of that. This one's more floppy. Uh, let's see what we got here. Now, he's in pretty good shape, I think. Should I speak too soon? I hope not. Now, I saw him in a catalog. I didn't get his name. I should have. But now that I, I'm looking at him, now I recognize him. I did see him in a catalog. So he's a known mask like a pig man. But that's a, a classic Bayshore type of design. You can see how shallow it is. Not much there. Really, without the, without the string, you, you can't wear it. That's the only way that it can hold on your head. It, it's not like a top stone, like the later top stones, which uh, went over the head. The early top stones were like this. They were half head, and they, you had to use a rubber band to hold them in place. Let's see here. He's cute. There's a little Frankenstein. I don't know if you can really make out very much detail in the camera. He looks, he's too wrinkly to really see much. Maybe if I take the paper out. Yeah, it didn't really help. But he's a, trust me, he's a Frankenstein. <laughs> Not much there. I mean, how'd you phone that? 
He's not rotting yet. This one feels like he's in pretty good shape. Just a fanciful monster. And like I was saying, that's just a, you know, that's a good example of just what is that? It's just a weird monster. And it's hard looking at it now, it's hard to put yourself in the mind of someone in the 1940s, early 50s, and how revolutionary the, these things were. People hadn't seen stuff like this before. Rubber masks were not common. They were just becoming a thing. In a mass-produced sense, there were individual rubber masks, but mass-produced rubber masks were just beginning to become uh, a popular product. And wearing something like that, and, and rubbery and jiggly like that, that was different. That was a new phenomenon. Now, this is a rabbit, obviously. Let me see if I can... There we go. Well, it's hard to, <laughs> I think that's the best it's going to be. So there's a rabbit. Just, you know, just a generic rabbit. And there's a lot of Bayshore characters like that. This is a cute little black cat. Now that's classic Halloween, classic old school Halloween. And there's a Keith Ward Topstone Black Cat that's a lot like this. It was an iconic image. I mean, a lot of companies obviously made black cats, uh, masks, paper mache pieces, later blow mold, uh, die cut, etc. That's an iconic image of Halloween. And there was a black cat around here earlier. You might have heard him meow a little while ago. Let's see what we have here. Ah, okay. Ah. So this is Cynthia. <laughs> Look at that wild eye. I mean, she's just supposed to be like winking at you, like flirty, but it looks bizarre. And this mask is called Cynthia. And she was kind of rotting. I had to patch her up there. Oh, these are the wolves. I wanted to deal with those separately. How many wolves we got here? I think those are all wolves. Okay. I'll save those for a second. This bizarre character is called Sad Apple. That's his name. Sad Apple. Like the apple you eat that grows on a tree. Sad Apple. That is the character's name. He's Sad Apple. And he's one of the early, all of these I think, are among the early characters. Here's a skeleton. And I don't know what his name is besides just skull or skeleton. He looks kind of like Papa Emeritus, doesn't he? And I have another one that's much mintier. This is like new, at least from the front. 
He's in great shape. If you look at his rubber band, that's in great shape. But if you look inside, you can see he's got this kind of marbling. That's the deterioration sitting in. So he's not going to stay great forever. But this is like a old store stock quality. You can just tell it's never been worn. Look at that band. This bat band has never been stretched. So I have this unused one and then a used one. And I like that skull. He's a cool character. And they're not exactly... I think this one's a little little bit bigger and the band is... He's got the black band. A lot of the old top stones have that black band. I think that's the older version with the black band. I think the other one's a later one. Okay, what did I set him there? All right. Oh, this is called... Um, it's just Princess, that's her name. She's getting a little crispy. That's Princess. She's got a little tiara, a little crown. And she's getting a little crispy on the edges because of, you know, the, like I said, like right there, a little crispy because of the, I think it's because of the metal from the, where the rubber bands attach. And it's causing a chemical reaction with the rubber. That's my hypothesis. That's just called Princess. Uh, where was she? Okay. What happened to Irishman? Did I show him? No. Where's Irishman? There he is. Uh, stick it into the bag. Okay. Okay, this guy is Irishman. That's his name. His name is just Irishman. That's that's it. Not a very imaginative name. But you see he's got his little red beard. It's kind of like a it could be a leprechaun if he had a hat on. And he's he's had some <laughs> deterioration issues as well. He's pretty cool. Uh, I had a Patch him up. Let's see. I guess that's gorilla tape back there. And there were a few nice ones I lost where uh, I looked at them, they were fine. I looked at them again sometime later, and they were just done. They were just gone. But uh, Irishman, I think I got to him in time. I patched him up, and I think that's helped hold them together. But. I'd like to foam. I'd like to foam all of them, but my gosh, can you imagine how hard it would be to foam something like that? It can be done, but that's quite a project. Okay, what? <clears throat> Let's look at these clowns. Oh gosh, did I do this? I can't even open this thing. Come on. Okay. Is all the same or are they different? I think they're, they're a little different. So this clown is rotting. He's look at that. He's he's in trouble. But I think uh, these are the same. Well, this one's the same. So here's a one better condition. Same character, much better condition. And here's a similar character, but I don't think he's the... No, he's not the same character. He's kind of a clown. He's not exactly a clown. Yeah, I guess he's not a clown. I looked at... I saw the red on his nose and thought he was a clown. Maybe he's a clown. I don't know. I think he's in, in the catalogs, but I didn't get his name. The clown, though, is Tramp Clown. So... The name of this character is Tramp Clown. There's, I think there's more than one clown, but you can tell because he's got the five o'clock shadow and it's actually sculpted on him. That's Tramp Clown. 
Okay. What should I show you next? We're gonna save the wolves. I'm not gonna do those yet. Let's see here. All right, these are Bayshore feet, all in various stages of deterioration because they're in bags. And then you see they has the name Jokesters. And I don't know if this is from the Topstone era or when it was still Bayshore, its own company. Let me see if there's anything that would... Because I know Topstone, when they sold the stuff, they sold it as joke items. That was their... No, this is before Topstone. Bayshore Industries, Inc., New York, a subsidiary of Minor Industries. So this is before Topstone. Topstone had not bought this. So this is 60s when, uh, when Minor owned it. And you can see it's rotting and at the bottom. Look at all that stuff collecting at the bottom. And again, you know, it's, there's, there's staples up there where that fabric attaches to the rubber. I think that's what's going on. I think it's because of those staples. Here's another one, a little better shape. And these are rubber feet with fabric ribbons. That one's turning hard, of course. I mean, I think it's already turned hard, but it hasn't turned to potato chips yet. This one's not bad. So this is probably the best condition as far as the rubber foot is concerned, but it's got that tear on the, on the card, unfortunately. Now look at the colors. Those are classic Bayshore colors. That kind of, you, if you didn't know who made this, you would just look at the color and say, oh, that looks like a Bayshore. So those are, you, as you can see with all these, there's a, there's a, a color scheme to Bayshore that, that's identifiable. And with some of its more iconic pieces, that's, that becomes important as part of what makes them popular is that funny, bright colored color scheme. Okay. Um, let me see here. Let me get this out of the way. I'm not going to lift up the whole box, just the top of the lid. This is a Santa Claus costume. Vintage Santa Claus costume, or well, it means the lid from from the Santa Claus costume. I thought there was a date on this. Because um, it's from Montgomery Ward. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if I'm going to find it right now, but I don't want to sit here staring at it for 10 minutes. But um, it's interesting that says New Bedford. Bayshore, New Bedford. This is falling apart. I need to conserve this box top. There's Bayshore Santa costume. This is New Bedford down here. Uh, well, the, it would be very difficult to pick up this costume in this box. Let me just pick up the Santa mask. I don't th think it's turning hard yet. Here's a Santa mask. You can see how terrifying that Santa mask is. I don't think any kid wants to meet him. He's like something from a Rankin Bass special. Like he would be a, a villain in a Christmas special. He would be, what would his name be? Like the Snow Miser or something. Uh, the Abominable Snow Miser of the Pole. I don't know. 
I do. It, it does have a little bit of a. I hear that there's like a kind of a crispy <laughs> sound. So he's he's uh, he's delicate. It's not cracked up yet, but he's he'll get there. And I can't really lift that the box is falling apart. But there's a brilliant red full Santa costume in that box. All right, so let's get this out of the way. Um, let us do a little change of scenery and prepare for the next part of this. So here we go. We're back. I freshened up a little bit here. Okay. Let's talk about these wolves. This character is simply called Wolf. And he is one of the more iconic Bayshore characters. This one is, has its uh, eyes cut out. As you're gonna see, he has bug eyes and that one doesn't have its eyes. I think this is an earlier one, a much earlier one. This is probably from closer to the original lineup. So that's sort of like a, I think that's like an early concept for the same character. It's not the same sculpt, but I think uh, it represents like an early stage of that character. And this is one of my favorite versions. Green, a green werewolf. He's not a werewolf. He's like a big bad wolf. He's green and red. Now look at those colors. Those are classic Bayshore colors. Bayshore masks are very colorful. They pop. I really like this variant of the of the wolf. He's holding up okay. He's, you know, in the usual spots. He's got some issues. Now, here's the most classic, iconic look for that mask. This is the the iconic Bayshore Wolf. If you see old photos, this is what you're going to see. If you see old advertisements or catalog photos, this is what you're going to see. That's the wolf, the Bayshore wolf. He is foamed. One of my earliest foaming experiments, and I didn't really know what the heck I was doing. <laughs> Look at that contraption. I didn't know what to do. I thought about redoing that and just trimming all that off, trimming him flat and putting a proper uh, rod into him so he's like that and has a base like this but i don't know i like this this is like a reminder of how far i've come you know back when i had just no clue how to foam some something so this is one of my first foaming experiments i think i did pretty good i mean he's still here look at him he survived all this time he still looks nice and that is what a base short mask is supposed to look like you know i've been showing all this nonsense you know, hand holding all these masks, these jiggly thin masks, and I'm sure they look like hell, but this, you know, this is showing it in its best light. This is what it should look like. That's Bayshore. Now I think you can kind of see why Bayshore is an important company in the history of Halloween pop culture in America and why it became so popular. 
this is what the kids look like when they wore those things. So that's one of the most iconic Bayshore masks. Uh, so this, now when we talk about Mothgo dreaming up just crazy weird things, this is what I'm talking about. This is the freak. Yes, he's phoned by me. You can see he's got an ear where one eye should be. I think uh, this hair is supposed to be a mustache. He's, his mustache is on top of his head. So he's all mixed up. And that nose looks kind of like the nose on the one of those rotting ones we saw at the top of the show. All twisted like that. Look at those colors. So this is also one of the more iconic Bayshore masks, the freak. He is nice. And there's another version of this mask that doesn't have the hair and has a different name. I don't remember what the name was. But they made this mask in two versions with and without the hair and they gave the non-hair version a different name. But the one with the hair is the freak. And I didn't realize the two masks were supposed to be different. A friend of mine had a catalog and looked at it. He has the other one without the hair and he pointed out there's two different names for those. There are two different masks based on whether or not they've got the hair. I didn't know that. This is the monster. That's his character name. He's just monster. He looks a lot like the zombie. Some people think he is the zombie. He is not. He's the monster. Look how thin that is. So yes, it can be done. I did it. And he was definitely rotting. I got to him just in time. He's lasted long. I mean, this had to have been a, what, gosh, a decade ago, a long time ago that he filmed this guy. So he's lasted quite a while. And just from what I see on the, on the monitor, uh, this looks like a image from a Bayshore catalog. That maybe I'm just, it looks like a catalog image, what I'm seeing here. Not that, this. That could be an image in a catalog. That is the monster. Now we're going to see the iconic classic Bayshore. This is the most iconic Bayshore mask. That's the zombie. As an original zombie, there are reproductions. This is not one of those. This is the original real Bayshore zombie. It was the best selling mask back in the day. According to those news articles, it's, it was the best selling Bayshore mask. This is Mafco's masterpiece, his most iconic creation. And now you can put a name to this. This is the Bayshore zombie, but you can put that name, Rudolf Mafco. Remember his name. He's the guy who designed this mask. And probably every mask we've seen in this episode. I did not foam him. That was foamed by Maskahuna, the greatest mask foam artist in the hobby. Maskahuna. And you can tell he did it. You can tell I didn't do it. There's the Bayshore zombie. Most of these masks are not very valuable. Even though I said there was the guy trying to get almost $200 for that little green one, I don't think he's going to sell that little green one for that anything like that. Most of these, you can buy like a stack of them for $15. If you go to a flea market or something, you, you see them. They're so common. 
well, not only common, they're, uh, they're not common actually, but in the individually, but they're so undesired, just nobody wants them. Um, so if you find them, there's just a few bucks. They haven't really got to the point where people are singling out certain characters like I got like I was doing. Here's Cynthia. Here's the Bayshore Cynthia mask. They're not doing that. It's just a mask. It's just a, it's a, they don't even know it's Bayshore. It's just some old mask, and uh, they haven't caught on uh, as individual collectors' pieces, except this one, the zombie. He he caught on a long time ago, so he can be a lot of money. Uh, I think there's one on eBay now for $900. I could see a thousand bucks in, you know, in today's market. I think that's possible. Certainly 500. I think that's probably the cheapest these days that you could find him at. I, you know, maybe you could look out and find him for 10 bucks somewhere. I don't know. But I mean, if you're buying him from someone who knows what he, what it is, yeah, it's going to be several hundred dollars. But this is a very, very iconic, one, one of the most iconic rubber Halloween masks in the mask collecting hobby. This is way up there. It's, and the reason I think that people care about Bayshore, if, if they, they don't really care about Bayshore, it's kind of a problem. But the reason some people like me care about Bayshore, it really revolves around that mask. This is the this is the central black hole in the middle of the universe and everything is the gravitational pull and everything kind of revolves around it. If this mask either didn't exist or didn't have the iconic quality that it does, I don't know that it would, I would be as interested in having these other masks. But since I've got this, it makes sense to have a Bayshore collection in which to put it in. So it's the centerpiece of the collection. And I do need to foam some more of those masks. So last thing I'm going to show you, the other most iconic <laughs> piece from Bayshore. This is a, a monster claw. I only have one that's in good enough shape to show you and to foam. This is foamed by Mascahuna. There are two of these obviously right and left. I only have, I have both of them, but the other one is rotted to pieces. It's just destroyed. This one is in good shape. And he's foamed, so hopefully he will stay in good shape. But look at those colors. One look at that and you just know that's Bayshore. No other company has colors like that. It's unique. This is very iconic. Famous Monsters number two. Uh, you may be familiar with that magazine cover, the second issue, not the first, the second issue of Famous Monsters magazine has Jim Warren wearing a mask and these gloves. He's wearing these Bayshore Monster gloves. And that mask is a whole other story. We won't even get into that, but that's another iconic piece with a very interesting story. But I don't have one of those masks, so... As a story for another day. Um, but he's wearing a pair of these Bayshore monster claws. And these turned up again and again. Even in movies, uh, they would be used. Like a B movie would use these as the monster's hands or maybe dress it up a little bit. These turned up in a lot of places because they're Excellent. They're exceptional monster hands. They're really beautifully designed. They look great. And if you repaint them, I mean, I'm obviously not going to repaint this vintage one. Like back in the day, if you were designing a monster for a film, you just repaint this and you've got the hands. I think in Dracula versus Frankenstein, at the end of the movie, the I think, I could be wrong, I think that Frankenstein is wearing these hands at the end of the movie. Not earlier in the film, but at the end, when the monster's makeup changes, I think he's wearing a pair of these Bayshore hands. There are only 
Well, there's only one wearable pair of these hands known to exist. And then there's this one. This is a left hand. So there's only two left hands known to exist. Genuine Beishuar monster claws. This one and one other. And then there's also in another collection a right hand. You know, a pair, a matched pair. And I've, I've got the right hand, but it's, you know, it's decimated. So I don't really consider myself the owner of a Beishuar right hand because it's just the condition is too bad. It's beyond repair but this is good this is a nice condition and it is one of only two known to exist and again this is just like that zombie this is very iconic if you're a monster kid if you're a mass collector if you know about this stuff you know that this is kind of a big deal this claw it doesn't seem like much it's just a hand but it's kind of a big deal there's a lot of history in this hand it was used in a lot of productions a lot of photographs taken people wearing these and it was advertised in magazines and comic books you know mail order ads for years and years and years and if you ordered it from one of those ads this is what you would get now, I don't know if it originally came in a bag with a header card, probably. It probably did, just like those feet we saw. And if, if it had stayed in one of those bags, it would prob probably be crumbling, just like they are. I've got some bag topstone stuff. Some hands, um, some feet, and uh, octopus hand, and some other stuff in, in bags. And the topstone bagged items tend to more or less stay intact. Not always, but they hold up better. Beishwar, it just it's prone to rotting. Something about, I don't know if it's the kind of rubber they used. Topstone used something called Lotol, which is a special compound made by the Nagatuck Chemical Company. And that's why perhaps Topstone items hold up better. Bayshore, I never heard anything special about the kind of rubber they used. So, as far as I know, they just used your run of the mill latex. And they, they rot before your eyes. But it, you can see that it is, it is possible, it is possible to have a nice collection of Bayshore masks. It is possible. It can be done. It can be done. Not many people bother to collect Bayshore for all the reasons I've described. Um, but maybe they'll start now. <laughs> I know I need to get on the ball and find some way to save a lot of the masks I've shown you tonight. Uh, I don't want them to disappear. And they're going, they're disappearing right now. These are saved, you know, hopefully. Uh, but I need to, I need to do more to preserve the other ones. And and now you know I'm I'm kind of um, I think this sort of reignites an interest in Bayshore. Uh, I might be interested in actually getting more Bayshore masks. Now that I kind of I know their names. I've lo I looked into the you know the catalogs and they're not just generic masks. They're like oh that's Cynthia, that's the Continental. Uh, so I might be interested in getting a few more and in taking care of them and foaming them like they deserve to be. But it's really hard. They're so thin. It's really hard to foam them. <sighs> okay, well, I think that's it. Hope you enjoyed this look at. Bayshore Industries. 
one of the iconic companies of Halloween and one that gets very little attention and very little discussion, at least with the mask. The, the blow molds, yes, but the mask, the rubber mask, no. You, no one ever talks about the rubber masks except this one. But there's a whole universe of Bayshore masks out there, and now you know Rudolph Mofko. You know that guy's name, the guy who sculpted these masks. That's it. I'll see you again. We'll have some more episodes before Halloween. Until next time, the one who dies with the most toys is dead.